My interview today is highlighting a recently published paper in JPRAS, which stands for, it's an International Journal of Surgical Reconstruction, basically. So our listeners may be patients or medical professionals, so I'll put the link in the show notes and on the YouTube channel for listeners to access this because it is an open access um, article. The title of the paper is Flap Neurotization Improves Sensation Outcomes in Abdominally Based Autologous Breast Reconstruction, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Whether you access articles and papers as a surgeon, a medical student, a patient, we are going to explore the elements and details of this research paper and how it can benefit you. I'm pleased to have two returning guests that I would like to introduce to you. The first is an author on the paper and an internationally trained microsurgeon who practices in Sydney, Australia. Dr. Joe Desseldorp is a collaborative surgeon who works alongside oncologists to perform innovative treatments for breast reconstruction, which includes deep flap. He's a TED Talk speaker, a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, Australian Society of Plastic Surgeons, faculty of medicine at the University of Sydney, and affiliated with the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse. My second guest, in no order of, appear of importance, is Dr. Minas Chrysopolo, the current president of PRMA, which stands for Plastic Reconstructive Microsurgical Associates, and that's in San Antonio, Texas. Dr. C is a board-certified plastic surgeon, breast reconstruction surgeon, and microsurgeon who, like Dr. Joe, performs autologous base breast reconstruction. Raised and educated in London, England, he has earned and received many academic achievements throughout his career. He continues his microsurgical, or he continued his microsurgical training after moving to the US and has co-authored and uh, or he is authored and co, you guys have so many accolades, I can't even read them all. He has authored and <laughs> co-authored several book chapters and scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals. And he's the developer of the award-winning free Breast Advocate app that provides anyone with breast cancer a much-needed voice in their breast cancer surgery decision-making. So after spilling out all those accolades... I'm going to put the link uh, for my esteemed guest and all of their um, great accomplishments in the show notes and the YouTube notes so that all of you can access them uh, if necessary. So in our conversation today, I will refer to them as Dr. Joe and Dr. C., Thanks for joining me again, and I I just don't seem to have enough time at the front end of this to spill out all of your great work, uh, both of you. So I'm so glad you joined me today to uh, talk about this paper that was just published. Is, isn't it? Pleasure to be here, first off, Yeah, th thanks so much, and thank you for the lovely words. Um, I don't think uh, I certainly could couldn't have done as good a job as as you just did, making me sound good. So 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 thank you. You're I just welcome. want to be like Joe. I want to be like Joe when I grow up. That's all. I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, but isn't it isn't it really cool? You look at the topic, such an important topic, breast sensation, and the reason or the 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 the, the catalyst for Joe and I meeting Terry to to first connect about sensory reconstruction with breast reconstruction the catalyst was you so how cool is that so thank you and 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 look at this now we've got papers being published and it's it's, it's awesome. awesome i know well like you'd say dr c it's bloody cool 
yeah it is bloody cool yeah, so it yeah. Is. yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't have i wouldn't have started talking to joe were it not for you so i'm uh i'm very thankful so yeah appreciate it very absolutely much. well so yeah. i i, I can remember of... that time mm -hmm. yeah no, no really closely because it was something that uh you know i don't i think it's what, what all good research questions arise from is um is from the, the kind of the patient side of the equation, what, what matters to people receiving the treatments that we provide. And I think it was really interesting for me to hear, you know, a patient advocate um, on behalf of people, you know, who actually within, within the network that you've created talking about sensation being a really big issue. And I remember thinking, yeah, I've, I've always kind of uh, wondered about that. I didn't realize there was a way to kind of make that better because obviously we've been doing breast reconstruction for a long time and in my training it was not something that was talked about at all you know we didn't really um we warned patients about feelings of numbness after surgery but we never really said oh look there's an act there's a solution for that or there's a potential solution even um so uh yeah i guess after meeting you know terry and then uh, saying look do you mind putting me in touch with minas i know he's doing uh he's doing some of this work and that really you know, he was so generous at that time and shared with me, I think, unpublished manuscripts of works that he was he was uh, working on technical papers about how he did it. Um, very generous with all of that, which was which was very appreciated. I Minas, mean, thank you for that. Um, anytime, mate. And, anytime. Uh, and yeah, and uh, really, it wasn't a massive step for us to be able to to do this um, routinely, and it's now routinely part of my the air flap operation. Um, and I think one of the things that you know that surgeons do as as due diligence when we when we're thinking about doing new procedures is to do literature review um and that's something which is a basic medical student practice we get taught that very early on in in our training um but what was great about this program pro, uh, project was i put together some really intelligent medical students so the the lead author on this paper is a um she's a, a third year medical student she's very bright and uh, she she wants looking for a project to sink her teeth into. And I said, well, look, you know, there's never been a systematic review of of outcomes of sensation and reconstruction after deep flap. Um, there had been a reconstruct. Uh, there had been a systematic review of of uh, all ty all types of of breast resensation, which includes you know implant based reconstruction and so on. But no one had systematically looked at just the, what happens if you do a DF flap and you rejoin the nerves inside the flap. You know, what happens to the sensation? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that needed to be done in my eyes because I'm, I'm not also I'm not doing the other technique with implant based reconstruction and nerve grafts and things, which is sometimes clouds the issue um, because you know that that's using a, a cadaveric nerve graft product off the shelf. That, that resensation technique is something which. Um, you know, I think you guys used the term uh, true sense, Minas, if I'm not mistaken, for this particular, what we're talking about today. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to kind of separate those two things and, and focus just on what happens if we rejoin the nerves within the flap, which, which to me made great sense. You know, really, um, it's uh, something that we, as a plastic surgery principle, rejoining nerves is, is, is possible and it's something we do all the time. So why not do it in the deep flap surgery? And, you know, the rest is history. You know, what I think is really cool, because I have the paper in my hand here, Dr. Joe, th this is what kind of uh, jazzes me as a patient talking to other patients. Um, it says, so, okay, I lost my place here. Oh, here. This is what really makes me happy is, is review compared sensory outcomes in neurotized versus non-neurotized abdominal-based autologous breast reconstruction. Here's the part I really like. To establish its benefit in routine clinical practice. I think really when it, you know, at the end of the day, that's why the three of us really like talking about this. And, you know, I was so happy to connect both of you. So... That's the part of the paper right at the beginning that really jazzes me. Um, okay, so you kind well, of we, we were quite mm -hmm. careful. Yeah, was, we were quite careful to to in, only include papers that were really done systematically. Um, so there was a the very high bar of which papers we would accept mm -hmm. to actually um, form part of the review, and they were also papers that used 
um, standardized uh, testing tools. So this is not kind of like a yes, no phenomenon. Is there sensation? Is there not? We're really looking for the grade of sensations and at what point after the operation, you know, the, the, the follow-up had to be at least over um, 12 to 18 months, um, which is about the, you know, sometimes the length of time we expect for this to really start to work. Um, and, and critics of the technique say that, oh, the body was just going to develop that sensation anyway. You know, you're just measuring something that the body was going to be able to do on its own. Um, but these papers had a control arm as well. They were often, you know, if it was only done in, in uh, a unilateral reconstruction, they were comparing, you know, to the patient's natural breast, or if it was done um, in other circumstances, they were comparing breasts that didn't have the nerves connected. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had, the, you had these three sort of, arms that in the paper sort of healthy breasts or that sensation is because obviously that can differ, differ from patient to patient mm -hmm. um, and then we had the the group that hadn't had the nerves connected and the group that had had the nerve connected um, and it was it was quite consistent you know it, there was uh, I think 12 studies and in, in all of the studies that there was a benefit um, seen to a, to a clinically meaningful degree like not just like a a 2% benefit, you know, it was a benefit that actually made a difference um, on the scale we use, which is, you know, is the sensation normal it's up here? Is it somewhat less than normal, but better than um, what we call protective sensation, which is if you were to touch something hot or sharp, would you feel it? And mm -hmm. then there was sensation that was, was lower down. So that I think that those three levels, in, in most cases, the, the reconstructed breast ended up in the middle somewhere, didn't get all the way back to what would have been you know, before any any uh, reconstruction or any mastectomy in the first place, but it was it was closer to to normal than than if we hadn't done anything. You know, I'm glad you brought up the protective sensation. I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but it won't be the first time. Don't laugh, Doctor C. Um, somebody on social media, and I don't know who it was. It just kind of ugh, raised the hair on the back of my neck when I saw it. They, they were talking about nerve sensation after mastectomy and during, you know, for breast reconstruction. And they said, well, why are they talking about, and I'm paraphrasing to be clear, why are they talking about protective mechanism? It, you know, we're only interested in erogenous uh, sensation. And I, I did not respond to it because I just didn't, <laughs> but I'm like, that's really the two important functions of nerve sensation. It's not only erogenous, which, you know, that's where our heads go when you're talking about breast and sexual function and all of that. It's the protective mechanism, which is so important. And, you know, Dr. C, you and I did a video on that once, and I think we got cut off by YouTube because of the you showed some pictures that uh, firsthand were patients, and it was a research paper. It was no patients of yours, but it was showing firsthand, you know, where patients were burned because they had no sensation in their breasts. So, yeah, anyway, it's a massive, it's a massive, I think it's a massive problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we see people come from other institutions, other places, you know. Thankfully, it's it's becoming less frequent now as the education is getting out there. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't too uncommon where you, you'd hear a scenario where a lady maybe had, you know, an achy breast or some kind of discomfort and someone advised them to put on a, a hot compress. And so, and the story would, would vary in terms of what the hot compress part of it you know, would be, for example, people would get, some ladies would get a washcloth and and dunk it in water and then put it in the microwave and then put this hot compress on their breasts without testing it on any other part of their body. And all, all you would need to do to really be sure that your skin can tolerate the heat would be to test that hot object on a sensitive part of your body, like the inner forearm, for example, that's a good place. And if, if it's tolerable there, then it's probably tolerable on the skin if the, if the skin quality on the chest is still adequate, still good. Mm -hmm. So 
um, it's a big problem, you know, when people come in and they've got these full thickness burns of the of their breast skin and, you know, an exposed implant, something like that. And, and it's been purely caused by uh, the damage from, from the burn. Um, and people also have to realize that in many situations, the quality of the skin that's left behind after the mastectomy, especially if they've had radiation, you know, this is not normal good high quality healthy skin that has that, that is as robust as non-operated skin right so it's very it's it, you've got to be very very super you know you've got to be super careful um the other point i i, I like that you made and, and i know we've talked about it is in terms of what the definition of function is right because when people talk about the function of the breath they, they think about breastfeeding mm -hmm. and they think about it as a sexual organ Right. Um, well, it's also covered in skin. So the skin over the breast gland also has a function, and that's what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. So the protective sensation is really, I think, underrepresented in people's thoughts when it comes to the importance of, of feeling. Um, and I know you've expressed this on multiple occasions about you know, before we even get to the, you know, very small percentage of women that have a new degree of erogenous feeling or feeling that for them is erogenous, not the same as before, but it, it, when it comes to intimacy, it, it, it can play a role, right? Mm -hmm. if, if we define erogenous in that way. Um, but for most people, it's, you know, knowing that, even if it's not erogenous, you know, n knowing that they are being hugged, you know, by a grandchild, or, you know, feeling that hug through clothing, you know, for, for instance, that alone, you know, knowing, knowing that you're touching yourself while you're washing your body in the shower, knowing that your partner is touching you, even though you're, you're not receiving that as erogenous, you know, you're being touched in mm -hmm. that setting, right? Mm -hmm. All these things are super critical for the sense of wholeness. And I think for, for recovery, you know? Um, so I, 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 again, I, 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 I'm so glad we're having these conversations and, and, and thank you for, you know, keeping it really front and center you know, in your patient advocacy efforts, I think it's, I think it's huge. Mm, and course. Joe, you, you know, this work right. you've done, you know, thanks mate for, for putting in the time and, and, and organizing it and, and putting the work out there because, you know, some data has been available as you know, for, for a while, but actually um, yeah. you, you and I both know that there have been, plenty of our colleagues in, in, in our own profession that have been reluctant to even give it a go exactly because of what you said, you know, it is absolutely true that with a tissue reconstruction, that's what autologous means, a tissue reconstruction, the body very frequently, uh, the nerves will regrow they'll grow back and, and since the reconstruction is tissue, the nerves from the chest can regrow into the tissue reconstruction. And ultimately some women do regain some degree of feeling. Typically it's from the edge of the breast working in towards the center, but, but absolutely it's true. Some women can regain some feeling, even if they do not have a formal nerve reconstruction procedure whether it's with a nerve graft resensation or whether it's using just the patient's own tissue and and as joe mentioned a prma that's what we refer to as true sets um but there is really i was so excited to see your paper joe because i think any body of work that that can bring other work together to really drill it home that there is evidence there that it works right mm -hmm. and um i think uh if patients know 
that the data is there. I think it's yet one more thing that can be discussed in their conversations mm -hmm. with their healthcare teams and their surgeons. And, and to really push and, and encourage their surgeons to, to read up, you know, and like Joe, I wasn't trained to do this coming through. I mean, I'm way older than Joe is. I, I wasn't trained to do nerve reconstruction in the setting of breast reconstruction. I, I, I did a ton of nerve reconstruction in the setting of hand surgery and, you know, digi digital, you know, uh, replantation and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, and, and to this day, there aren't many programs around that, that train bre breast microsurgeons that are really routinely teaching it, unfortunately. So we, we have to change that. And it starts with great papers like Joe's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that, uh, that was really interesting from the paper was, um, you know, what data isn't there, Minas? And it's obviously that's the kind of thing that, you know, we've got more work to do, obviously. There's not, this is, uh, there's no resting on the laurels because one of the things that I wanted to know, um, you know, because we're doing so many more skin sparing and nipple sparing mastectomies nowadays is, you know, what were the differences in sensation between these patients who had this kind of operation and, and say someone who had a traditional flat closure and delayed reconstruction? Because obviously there's a lot more of the abdominal skin on the breast if you go through a delayed approach after a flat closure. Um, and then you're much more likely to get into the situation you mentioned before where you could have burns and things on the, on the chest wall if that tissue is not, doesn't get a good, good nerve supply. Whereas sometimes with the skin sparing mastectomy, it's only you know, the, the, uh, the nipple areola complex that is mm -hmm. actually tummy skin. And with a nipple sparing mastectomy, sometimes there's no abdominal skin on the breast at all. And we're measuring, you know, fine tactile sensation of the breast. So, so what was interesting, there was one paper within that group that, that did sort of subclassify um, for a mastectomy type, but, um, but no, none of the others did. And we actually contacted all the authors of all the papers and said, you know, can you, can you share with us the data, you know, breaking it down by mastectomy type? And unfortunately, you know, those papers have been written so long ago that, you know, none, none of those authors, you know, had access to the data anymore. So it just means we have to do the work again. Um, but I, I, in my sort of own mind, when I'm doing this operation, I'm not sure who's going to get the most benefit, but I'm, I'm still doing it. If, uh, if it's, if it you know, doesn't take a significant amount of extra time, you know, I think it's about 15 minutes on average for most of the papers published and from talking to yourself and us and from my own experience, you know, that that's not a lot of time, but it's enough, you know, if it's going to take more than that, and I'm not sure if the nipple spray mistake to me, I might say, well, we might not do it in this circumstance because I'm not sure if it's actually going to help. Um, but I would say that it, anecdotally, I do think it helps a little bit. Um, I think it helps, you know, as you mentioned, with that feeling of, of where the breast is in space, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there are still sensory organs inside the, 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 the end of where those nerves go, you know, Terry, that attaches to little senses that not just, they don't just sense, sense fine touch. They can also sense position and movement. Mm -hmm. Um, like Vanessa mentioned, so what we call proprioception where the, where the, where the tissue is in space, they also can sense temperature changes. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, some of the patients come back saying that they can better appreciate cold sensation than they could before. So if water's running on the chest or um, those kind of things are, uh, we haven't studied that at all yet. Um, so, you know, there's still, still more work to be done. You know, we, I definitely play down the erogenous sensation um, component because obviously I understand that's where people's minds go when you're talking about restoration of sensation. And I haven't experienced what Minas is talking about there where there's a certain group of women that, that do, have some return of erogenous sensation, but I guess we haven't followed our patients long enough. And I'm guessing that's something that the brain fills in the gaps, um, you know, and you've given it the avenue for some of those normal functions to return. I'm sure some people, the brain can achieve that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's not something that we would, would suggest is possible in, in our, in our own patients yet. Uh, but hopefully that would be great. So yeah, yeah that, I, those are I just think... some of the areas, I guess the next steps. Yeah. And I think the erogenous sensation too is is a little more complex than just you know the hot cold and the and the touch. It's it's a little more complex. Um, yeah, of course. But you know, I do hear patients uh, talk about the mind body connection. That's how patients refer to it as. So, 
I, I'm curious, um, Dr. Joe, because I just got back from the breast surgeons meeting and I was actually talking to the nerve graft people because I told them about your paper and I said, oh, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting ready to interview Dr. Joe and Dr. C on this. But, but there were some um, tools that you referred to earlier. So I kind of just wanted you to briefly touch on them so that if, you know, by chance patients do any of the breast cue or are tested by any surgeons on their, their sensation, there's a couple I was really curious about. And, and I did talk to them about this at their booth. Um, one of them's the preferred, it's, I call it the SWIM, but S-W-M. And then the other one is the P-S-S-D, which is, you know, less, less used. Can you just, cause that's, those are both mentioned in the paper. Can you tell us how those work and, and what yeah. they, what they do? Cause they're kind of different functions. The, the P they are different. Yeah. I think that they're, they're both measuring the same thing. They're measuring what degree of, of force that you apply to the skin to actually you know, achieve a certain amount of um, perception of the patient of there being some some something sens sensation. I've got my uh, my Sandy man joining us. Hi, Sandy Hi. man. <laughs> happy Anzac Can I come Day. And, uh, make your breakfast in a minute. <laughs> uh, Terry said, "Happy Anzac Day." It's in the in the okay. pot on top of the car. Okay. Um, beside the bed. The, guy, the boys are going surfing and they need their wetsuits. Um, but the Absolutely. yeah, so the, the stem talk about thing. sensation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's called <laughs> um, the Sems Weinstein monofilament. So these, there's essentially like a series of different degrees of thickness of monofilament that you can put onto the skin, and it and it registers the result. And sometimes the very finest monofilament is super fine, and you can some people can barely feel that on their even on their um, their fingertip. Um, so that one we almost never get on the chest wall skin. And then the others, um, you know, can be really, really thick. So it's a it's a, a, a logarithmic scale. So the the very thickest one, if you can't feel that, you really don't have much sensation at all. And then the the PSSD, this pressure sensory specific device, this is something that only a few institutions have as a research tool. It's quite an expensive piece of kit. Um, so so it's a computer based program that um, pushes the little probe onto the skin and. Essentially, once when you recognize that you can feel it, it can give you a very um, accurate measure of at what degree of, of pressure you can actually feel something. Mm -hmm. So rather than having discrete little little probes, it can do that, you know, sort of across a continuous scale. So it's a nice thing to have. And we did include the, the results of those um, studies in the paper because obviously that's the, the highest level of evidence mm -hmm. kind of available using the most accurate tool. Mm -hmm. The problem is not everyone can can have access to that kind of research um, research equipment and so it's it's not a useful tool when you're doing a trying to combine lots of studies together um right. you can't then combine the study the results of that study with people who have used sems weinstein monofilament testing so i think sems weinstein monofilaments are the key because i can have one of those little they cost a couple of hundred dollars and i can keep them in my my bag and do the sensory testing kind of on the go you know, when i'm meeting patients in the clinic or in the operating room or wherever so We've been able to capture a lot more data using using a more simple um, tool like the Sense Weinstein monofilaments. Mm -hmm. So, so another tool, if you will, Doctor C, that I that was in the paper that I kind of want patients to hear about because I mean I hear about it often. I don't know. I don't know if other patients do. Uh, of course, you two are so familiar with it. It's the breast cue. Can you tell us a little exactly, bit about yes. that, Dr. C, and then, you know, why, you know, if patients hear that term in clinic or they're asked, would you mind filling out a breast cue? Can you tell us a little about what it is and then, you know, what are the benefits of participating in something like that, especially yeah, in this it, setting? It, yeah. So the breast cue is a series of so there are lots of different types of breast cue. The, the breast cue surveys basically collect the patient's viewpoint. So it's patient reported outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not what the surgeon reports that the patient is experiencing. It's the, what's the, what the patient is feeling. Mm -hmm. So patient reported outcome measures are really a critical aspect of, of research now, um, increasingly so. 
And for a while, the breast cue um, didn't have, it, it has different modules that really focus on separate things. And mm -hmm. now there's a sensation module uh, within the breast cue, uh, which is which is super helpful. But <clears throat> really, I think, you know, having a patient reported outcomes aspect to any research study really elevates the quality of it. Yeah. And so it's something to look for. And and if if patients have opportunity to contribute and they're up for it, you know, we we'd really appreciate it because it's really important data for us to to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like in a way it's kind of being, you know, a patient advocate in a clinical setting setting, if you will. So, uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because patient advocacy comes in different forms, right? Contribution, yes. d just different ways. Well, okay. I would say that it is a lot of surveys to fill in and that's something which, you know, can become tiresome. So we're mindful of how many times we ask people to fill in these kind of surveys because, yeah. you know, you can get fatigued, survey fatigue, you know, from filling in too many surveys. Um, but yeah. I think that it's something which, um, Sorry, this is my other little guy here joining us. This is Archie. Um, Hi, Archie. So, but yeah, so I, I think we we ask our patients to do the breast cues and but we kind of, we say, look, tell us if you're getting fatigued because uh, we know that we don't want you to kind of be, you know, sort of just filling in another survey. But it, but I do think most, most women are happy to do it um, because they recognize that we're trying to make things better until we hear their voice. You know, we might think we're doing a great job um, but you, you really need to hear it from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so Archie, if, if this was tomorrow at this time, I would have my two grandchildren sitting in my lap because they're coming over to spend the night with Nana and pop Pop tomorrow. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to get daddy off the call here so he can take you surfing. And I know Dr. C has commitments too. I just want to wrap up. First of all, I, I really want to thank both of you for talking about this paper because, you know, I think a lot of times as patients, we, you know, we hear things like um, in different Facebook groups or wherever, oh, well, there's a study done on that or research says, well, I don't know if they often quite fully understand the value in all the work and the reasons that go behind doing these papers. So I'm really glad that both of you kind of unpacked a lot of the details and the reason this paper was written today. But so I have a hypothetical question for you both as we wrap up. Uh, you might want to comment on the conclusion of the study and, and where you think we're both headed. But let's, I'm going to throw out a hypothetical question that you can answer or not. Uh, what would you two write a paper about? There's no right or wrong answers here. <laughs> and you can't write one on, on the proper surgical music in surgery. I think that's already been written. So sorry, you can't choose that. I sent you that. Yeah. that that's, what I, I, that's exactly what I was going to say. I was, I was going to say the value of different music genre in outcomes i was gonna i was gonna try and be smart and say something like that but you beat me to it you beat me to it mind reader what do you I, think i love Dr. the idea Joe? of a, a, a multi-center study um comparing comparing things um I, i'd love to include some of vanessa's outcomes in uh in some some work that i'm looking at which is also the um the abdominal function piece i've got a new um a new way of measuring abdominal function before and after surgery that I'm that I'm working up, and um, I'd love to share that. It's super simple, Manas. So it's something that right. you would have the equipment to do in in your clinic, um, and uh, I feel like we need that because we've done another systematic review. You know, spoiler alert, but it's um, looking at abdominal function after DEP flap versus tram flap, um, and uh, you know, it's it's interesting that I think that in that space there's been a lot of um, confounding by comparing results after unilateral reconstruction where half of the six pack muscle is still intact. Mm -hmm. um, so we've just focused on bilaterals um, and we've looked at papers that um, you know, ha have objectively measured abdominal function. 
So that's that's where I want to go next with my research, Terry, is to look at abdominal function because I you know I feel like um, still there are some of my colleagues who who don't believe the hip flap is superior to tram flap or muscle sparing tram, um, and so we wanted to look at that and. Yeah, there's no no surprise that when you do a systematic review of the literature, it is superior. But it's something which, uh, you know, there's there's nuance to the research. So I'll, I'll wait till that one is published to I send it your way. But then I'll, then I think offline. I mean, as you and I've got to talk about this new new abdominal function measuring system that we're creating because just doing a sit up is not enough. I think you know we can a lot of our patients can do sit ups you know before and after surgery, and that's that's great. But it's sort of a yes no. Can you, can't mm-hmm. you situation and a lot of other yeah. muscles contribute to the sit-up. Um, so we want to kind of focus in on the rectus muscle because that's the muscle which potentially at risk from a deep flap. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a, I'm excited to share that with you, but we'll save that for another day. Ooh, okay, I hear forward a th- to it, mate. I have, I hear a throw down. So now we're going to have to do a paper <laughs> on what's the best place to visit Australia or Texas. Oh, that, that, <laughs> that would be Australia uh, was. I'll just give Australia it. was very good well, to Australia's me. When I was looking there, like right but now. it's been it's been forever. I mean, yeah, I think it's time for another visit. Yeah, <laughs> I. Well, I, they, I may let, been... they may not let me in though, mate. They may not let me in. Yeah, yeah you have history. But, uh, I think we. I think we'll make. You have history, we'll dude. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to both places. I'm I'm gonna go see Dr. Joe. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, know. Yeah, I knew that was Let's coming. I knew that was coming. <laughs> come on, you know Australia is so cool and they have really great Anzac cookies. It's Anzac Day. So hey, you guys, yep. thank you so much Anzac for day. joining me. It was fun. It was informative. And I just hope that a lot of people. We'll look at the show notes and information and read this paper. I have outlined it and gone through it and loved reading it. Um, we're going to put it. In it's open inter- access, which is important. Yes. I think you mentioned that earlier, but it's something which, um, you know, I think particularly for research that that um, is real, like not a, not every paper we would expect patients to be able to read and and understand. But I think this is one of them where you could actually mm-hmm. read this and and understand kind of the uh, the findings. Um, maybe not some of the scientific jargon, but at least the, the discussion. Um, and so I think it's important to make those papers open access um, a little more costly for us as researchers, but I think it's something which uh, is worth it. Yeah, I do and, too. And, and it also means that patients can print them out if need be and take them to their physician. Share decision-making conversation. All good. Sounds great. All good. Is our work done here, gentlemen? I don't think so. I think so. I think, I think Joe, so. Joe is something <laughs> at the bit to hit some waves. I think so, too. <laughs> Thank you both so much for joining me today. And great to see the cross-continental uh, connection again on um, Deep Sea Journey podcast. But we're also going to put this on the Deep Sea Foundation YouTube channel. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having us. See you, Terry. Right. See you, Matt. Mm-hmm.